62 to 72. This is kind of a, a primer on US first issue, second issue, third issue revenues, and also kind of a little mini tour of my 10 frame exhibit that I've had. I start out with just a real colorful, nice matching use st stock certificate here. Some of the stuff can be very colorful. Some of it can be pretty drab. We'll see. Um, prefer, I'm unfamiliar, folks unfamiliar with it, what is a matching use? What was what? Uh, for those for those folks unfamiliar with the area, what is a matching use you refer oh, we'll, to? We'll get to that. I'm sorry. I got all kinds of explanations to start it all out. So it's just, let's go to start with the beginning. You know, there was a, an act of July 1, 1862 to provide internal revenue to support the government and pay interest on the public debt. Basically, I got smart right up front and said, this civil war is not going to end soon. We need to start raising funds to help support it. On August 8th, the Treasury Department sent a memo to Butler and Carpenter and said the Secretary has, of the Treasury has accepted Proposition Number 6, which was their proposition to print all the stamps with all the pricing and requirements. October 1, 1862, the tax was effective. It was a very little time. Butler and Carpenter only had 53 days to prepare all the plates, rolls, dies, and print all the different stamps and denominations required. Mm. You can see here, I've got a couple of nice uh, checks from the Bank of Commerce, one from October 7th, where there were no stamps available. And then in November, they had stamps by then. So there's a, another one stamp. Yeah. So a total of 102 different tax types, values, and colors were eventually printed. That's R1 to R102 in Scott Catalog. Of these, 14 of them were for proprietary and playing cards. Oh, my God. And Folks, if you're not issues. speaking, please mute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Of these 14 were for proprietary and playing cards, and 88 were issued to show payment of the documentary tax. My exhibit is based just on the documentary tax. Two reasons. One, the proprietary were all on tins, bottles, jars, and playing cards run packs of playing cards, both things that are kind of hard to show in an exhibit. So... Uh, on October 1, the first day of the tax, there was only one stamp had been delivered. It was a two-cent bank check, and I make a point that it's yellow. In the catalog, they're all, all the two-cent stamps are listed as orange or blue, but the first issue is really a yellow. So there were 77 stamps issued to indicate payment of the October 1 documentary tax. Nine more were issued in March of 63, and two more in 1864. The two-cent yellow stamps would not print well. The impression be, would be poor and indistinct. About October 10th, the printers were given orders to change a color to blue. So this changed the color for three documentary stamps and proprietary and playing cards from yellow to blue. That's why these yellow stamps are much rarer. Some of them were barely even printed or issued at that point. So there's some of them were very rare in those early shades. Then in early 1864, in August 1864, orders were given to change the two cent stamps to orange. So the Scott catalog does not differentiate at all between those first yellows that were only in place for the first not even month and then blues up to August 64 and then they went to orange after that. So there's uh, some extra rarity to those early ones. Um, circumstances related to the short time available to develop and print the stamps also resulted in all the imperfect and part perfect stamps. Um, if you think about it, you know, we just started perforating stamps, what, in like 1857? So 1862, we hadn't had a lot of practice printing stamps and perforating them. So uh, initially the printers strived to deliver all stamps fully perforated. Um, that was the first goal. So contrary to what a lot of people think that the first ones were imperfect, the first ones that did get released were all perforated. Um, another uh, letter from Butler and Carpenter to the acting commissioner of revenue dated November 7th said that your telegraphic communication Fill all orders for stamps with utmost dispatch without perforating is duly received and we will act at once thereon. Only nine different stamps have been delivered by November 7th. Those are all perforated. Starting November 15th through November 25th, 25 stamps are delivered. Undoubtedly, many of them were imperfect or part perforate because it sped up the whole process to get the stamps out. Now let's talk about the stamps. Now, those of you that have ever looked in the catalog or that do collect these things, you'll see these stamps are issued for a plethora of different types of things. You can see how the examples I've shown here, there's a two cent express, a 20 cent inland exchange, which is like a uh, 
promissory note or an agreement to pay, 30 cent in an exchange, a 50 cent lease, dollar 60 is on a foreign exchange, and that's the same kind of thing. It's sending money only to a foreign country. Then three dollar, that one on the bottom is a charter party. Um, that's for renting ships. Five dollars a manifest for a manifest on a shipment on a ship. The fifteen dollar one is a mortgage. And then the $200 one was just an internal revenue stamp. It was issued later, so it did not get a special designation. Um, so you can see when the first act came, came in, in September, they had that one stamp available, the bank check. October, there were eight, 25 more in November, and 41 in December, and two in January. I gave you 77 that were issued like up front when they were all, uh, all approved at that point. In March of 63, act they changed some of the rates such that there was a four cent and six cent rate for inland exchange for promissory notes and there were no four cent and six cent stamps except proprietary and at the time you were not to use proprietary stamps on documents then in april 63 they also issued some higher value stamps just to facilitate higher value transactions um 64 they issued the two cent usir united states internal revenue basically to pay for the receipt tax. And then there were also a few higher values, a 25, 15, 200 that were issued in 63 and 64 to round us up to all 88 different stamps. Stamp paper also was used to facilitate large volumes of transactions. Um, the Internal Revenue authorized a group of companies to print stamps onto paper that was then used mostly by banks, insurance companies, a few other businesses to pay the tax. Stamp paper was only useful for a few of the tax types where the majority of the transactions were tied to a fixed rate. Bank checks were by far the largest customers. After eight, August 64, all bank checks subject to tax were taxed at two cents. Before that, if there were checks for under a certain amount, they weren't taxed. So they didn't wanna print these two cent tax stamps on all the checks and then have all these checks come through that didn't need them. That was a waste of two cents. The tax types, there were a total of 24 different documentary tax types in the original act. The act of 1863 added a bill of sale of ship and the act of 64 added a weigher's return and receipts. The receipts were designated for payment of money, delivery of property by an express company, and delivery of property by a non-express company. Express companies were very powerful back then the original act, they were able to get the tax on the receipts rescinded and just turned into a, a like a tax filing where they would file their report every month and then pay a tax on that. It was so much easier to manage. Stamps were issued for all these 24 types. As in addition, they issued the higher denominations of 25, 50, and 200, and then the two cent for receipts. Now, Something happened right away. The original idea with all these different tax types was that they would be able to measure the economy. You know, if all these stamps or leases were being sold and used, then that's how much lease uh, activity was going on. Mortgages, a conveyance, which is a deed or a property sale. All the different things, they were trying to measure all that. But by, by December 25th, 62, just a couple months after the act went into place or three months after the act went into place, they basically said in, in legalese that no instrument, document, writing, or paper of any description required by law to be stamped shall be deemed or held invalid and of no effect for the want of particular kind of description, kind or description of stamp designated for and denoting the duty charge. Provided a legal stamp or stamps denoting a duty of equal amount shall have duly been duly affixed and used thereon. Provided that the provisions of this section should not apply to any stamp appropriated to denote the charged duty charge on proprietary articles. So basically what that said is you could use any type of documentary stamp and any type of document. And this was just a, a, a concession to the printers because there was no way they were succeeding in getting all these doc, different types of stamps, those 88 different stamps printed and distributed and it was, was not happening. So they gave up on that grand plan. On my exhibit, um is basically what i call this whole history it's kind of like postal history only it's on documents and it's all documents with the stamps on them showing the taxes and a lot of other interesting things the tax act that listed the document stamps was schedule b 
That was just in alphabetical order. In order to present a more coherent story to illustrate the taxes, I grouped the exhibit into seven major categories. We had money transfer, real estate, personal property, transportation, other contracts, legal or court activity, and then corporate activity. That's just a way to kind of group them and keep coherent things together. Um, Civil War fiscal history documents from the beginning of the tax until December 25th are much scarier since there was less than three months in this time period. Documents with matching stamps from the earlier period of the tax are also more desirable. So here's my definitions of what I use in my exhibit. The obligatory matching use, which is abbreviated OMU, was from that first day, October 1st through December 25th, when that matching stamp was required for each type of document. An early matching use or an EMU is the matching stamp type used from December 26th through June 63, approximately, where any documentary type stamp could be used on any document. So you could use any one you wanted to, but of course some of the businesses that had you know, limited businesses only ordered the stamps that they wanted and at some points they got those stamps because the government was sort of trying to still do that. But uh, most of the time they got whatever was you know, available at the time. Nominally, nominally illegal use was the use of proprietary or playing card stamps that were not allowed. They still were trying to measure the difference between all the proprietary medicines and you know, those are the matching medicines and, uh, and, and stamps that they used and uh, playing cards, which were also called proprietary at that point. And then postage used as revenue. The use of postage stamps was illegal. The document would be rendered invalid in court of law until properly paid with revenue stamps. That's because, you know, postage stamps, that money went to the postal department. You know, Treasury didn't get that. So they didn't want to be the post office getting any money out of them. So each of the seven major categories starts with a little heading and a little uh, description of the tax. So you can see in this money transfer, we have a bank check, which is obvious, an inland exchange, which is mostly a promissory note, a receipt for payment of money, protest, which we'll get to when we get to that page, a certificate of deposit, put money in the bank like we do now with CDs, foreign exchange, moving money between the US and other countries, and the foreign exchange incoming from another country into the US. I mean, back in the 1860s, checks were a lot less frequent than we see today. The vast majority of the people did not have checking accounts. So it was mostly the more well-off and business accounts. Um, so, but still the check and promissory notes were the biggest way to transfer money between those groups. Uh, one of the things they did miss out on was the receipt tax. In the original law, they didn't put a receipt tax in. So starting August 1, they put a two cent tax on receipts. So basically, if you would have gone into the store today and gone to Walgreens and bought something, you would have had to pay a two cent tax if any purchase exceeding $20. So that was kind of onerous and that was a lot of work to put all those little stamps out there. So that's why there's hundreds and, or millions, hundreds of millions of those stamps issued. When a checker note was not paid, a protest was filed with the court declaring that it was not paid and there was also a tax on that. CD is explaining what that is. Foreign exchange or bill of exchange is a way to transfer money. So that's my little lead into each of these little categories. Now we'll get into some of the interesting documents and things I have to share. Uh, my exhibit is 10 frames. Uh, it's four panels in each frame, big huge panels that are as big as four pieces of paper. Because as you'll see, some of these documents, the most of them in here are smaller because I couldn't scan the giant documents, but I have one four panel that or panel that only has three things on it because they're just big, huge documents. So this is a bank check. You know, it's a nice engraved bank check from the Merchants Bank in Burlington, Vermont. Burlington, Vermont, there was a, the Merchants Bank, there was a huge hoard of these checks that were discovered and uh, got to the market. I have numerous checks from Burlington, Vermont, and all kinds of different kinds. And, and this one's interesting because it's the two cent bank check with the double transfer. And if you look at the bottom of the stamp where I blew it up there, you see how that bank check is just, it almost looks like it was totally printed twice. It's a very distinct double, double transfer listed in the catalog. Um, here's a bank check that was first paid with a postage stamp, your common three cent Washington. And you can see by the signatures being the same, somebody said, you can't use postage stamps, you gotta put a stamp on it. So right away that one got corrected. Sometimes they'd catch it later on down the road and you know, the bank would do it, but this one was the person that wrote the check 
caught, caught it right away. This is an interesting, this is what we call one of the OMUs. And then you see it says RMU here. That's because I changed it from RMU to OMU later on as a required matching use, now as obligatory matching use. And this was stamped with 25 different 10 cent inland exchanges. It's a promissory note for $6,000. Tax was $2.50. But at that time, only the 5 cent, 10 cent, and 30 cent were widely available. So they had to pay the tax. They had to use inland exchange stamps. This is one of the reasons it didn't work well. That's all they had were 10 cent stamps. So you can see they crowded 25 stamps on here. And technically, this was not legitimate because you were not supposed to overlap the stamps at all. Because then you could have stamps that were already canceled under that overlapping and reuse stamps. But... Uh, they got away with it here just because it was so early in the, in the process and that's all they had. That's a real neat piece. And here's just a nice, another one. This is a 1863 promise here notes. So this is an early matching use. It's a promissory note. And the difference between a check and a promissory note is a check is negotiable at site or that, that day. Promissory notes are all in the future. So this is four months after date. So when the promissory notes were first taxable, it was for set amounts. There was a tax for about five cents for under 100 and then it went on and on and on up and however you went. And this was for between 350 and 500. The tax is 20 cents. Here's a, another inland exchange or promissory note. And you can see this was 10 days site and $50. It was taxed at five cent per hundred. In the act of August 1864, they changed the rates again on promissory notes to make it simpler. There were two major rate changes. They had the original rate in effective October 1, 62. March of 63 is when they added a couple more and then they changed the rates. And in August of 64, they really changed the rates and simplified many of them. And this one went from a, a crazy rate schedule that was based on the number of days or months that the, the note was due and then how much it was for. So. This was much simpler, five cents per hundred or fraction, much, much simpler. This one's kind of interesting because it was used as provisional currency. Um, when the Civil War started, all coin basically disappeared. People hoarded all the silver and gold out of the circulation to, to have some kind of a tangible asset. So, you know, there was postage stamps that were encased postage stamps. And then there were the printed ones of postal currency. And then some people came up with an idea to, to just write a note and say, hey, this is for $50, you can pass it on. You know, the, the Pennsylvania mine in Upper Michigan was a going operation and people trusted their paper. This is another promissory note that's kind of interesting. You can see it was written in November 68. There's one year note with interest paid November 69 and the note was renewed. So if you read on the back on the right hand side, it says interest paid on this note to November 10th, 1870. And then they had to renew the note for another 40 cent tax. And then it says again, interest paid on this note up to 1871. They renewed the note again and had to pay the 40 cent tax again. So uh, it's interesting that they kept writing it for one year and then paying tax each time. They could have written it for three years and only paid tax once. Here's a promissory note tax correct, incorrectly with a three cent Washington and a two cent blackjack. Um, nice issues. And here this five cent tax was caught later on. And it was, I think it might even have been another day, no, second month. And these are interesting. It's uh, second month, first, 1865. These are Quaker dated, it's called. The, the Pennsylvania Dutch didn't believe in the pagan names for months. So they, first month, second month, third month. Here's a receipt for the payment of rent. And this one is nominally illegal use of the proprietary stamps. Um, you don't see two one cent stamps on checks or receipts very often because the two cent stamps are printed in such quantities. So it's a little unusual that they would have a, a couple of proprietary stamps at this company. Um, possibly they had some kind of a proprietary business there too. Now this is a receipt. <laughs> this is for the Union Business College from Philadelphia. And this is basically that someone has become a student at the Union Business College, is entitled to instruction uh, for an unlimited time in bookkeeping. You can read it's business, arithmetic, and penmanship 
letter writing, the forms and customs of business declamation, calligraphy, and to the attendant upon lectures and commercial law detecting counterfeits, money, etc. So it's, it's quite a broad thing that you learn when you when you went into business. And the people used to go to business college quite frequently back then to learn how to be a clerk and, and how to how to manage a business. It was a thriving uh, business. And this gentleman, you know, signed up and got a quite fancy certificate to, to go to business college. But like at the top, it says, "Youth is the banker of old age." Not exactly sure what that means, but it was interesting. Here we have was what's called a protest. You can see there's a promissory note attached at the top of this and all the, the form underneath that you can't see the top part of is they're basically saying that this note was, you know, was given to me and it was not paid when it was presented. And then a, a notary public had to notarize that this is true and, and he was the right guy and he was due the money. And then there was a 25 cent tax on that. So that's how you do it back in the old days to, to try to get your money and collect it. Here's a certificate of deposit. And this is a beautiful early matching use from uh, January 63. It's a Bank of Birmingham in uh, New York. Uh, beautiful vignette with a Indian kind of leaning there and an eagle flying by. And to the left, you've got like a Lady Liberty or something over there. And this is just a beautiful stamp. And a, it's a two cent certificate, which is a little more less common stamp than the bank check on the other ones. It's got a really nice cancel on it tied to the tied to the page. So this is a very nice uh, example of an early matching use. Here's a certificate of deposit from Bank of California in Gold Hill, Nevada. Nevada was the only state that set up a broad grouping of taxes nearing the federal ones. There's only a couple states. California had some taxes. Um, Oregon had a, had a insurance tax, and then Nevada had taxes on things, and then Louisiana had a, a seal tax. Whenever you had to get something with a, a document that was sealed, there was a tax on that. But Nevada basically took the federal guidelines, and in 1865, right after they became a state, they figured out they need some money too, so they started issuing their own tax stamps and uh, charging taxes. They weren't quite all the same, but this is a good example. This was taxed for five cents for amounts over 100, but Nevada taxed them, and there were only two cents for amounts over 100. So this was only two cents in Nevada, but five cents federally. Here's a foreign exchange, and this is basically a, a, a document that would be prepared usually in sets of three. And you can see this one says, after sight of this third of exchange, unpaid, paid to the order of. The reason they would do sets of three is they would send one on a boat, they'd hold the other two back. Sometimes they'd send another one on a boat, and hold the third one back because of the un, you know, uncertainty of communications and shipping and everything else back in the 1860s and 70s. So this one's a nice one because it's got uh, a beautiful third issue or second issue blue uh, 30 cent stamp, which is quite rare on documents. Here it's showing the second and third still attached. So this, in this case, they sent the first of exchange on. It must have arrived and got processed and paid out and second and third just stayed in the files and eventually was liberated from the files. But each one of those three had to be taxed the full amount. Here it's only a nickel, but these things could be up to, you know, thousands of dollars in transactions that would require, you know, $100 tax or more. Very rare, but $20, $30 are not that rare. Here's an incoming foreign exchange from Havana, Cuba, 1868. Um, $5,000 tax at the end of the exchange rate of five cents per hundred. So nice, very nice use of the 250 stamp that they issued for these higher transactions. So in the revenue world, you know, just like in the stamp world, you wanna to try to find the right stamp on the right document and solo is even better where you can get a nice one paying the rate it was made for. Now we'll move on to real estate type transactions. In this area, I've got a conveyance, which is a deed, a mortgage, a power of attorney for real estate, and then a lease. So uh, conveyances were fairly, fairly common. Mortgages less so back then. Um, leases were more in the cities. I mean, once in a while you find something out in the smaller towns, but most leases were city related. 
and the power of attorney was sometimes granted to affect a transaction. So here's the top piece of a conveyance. This is taxed at $119.50. So this conveyance was for between $119,000 and $119,500. And this has got all second and third issue stamps on it. And you can see those two $50 second issues a nice $5 and $10 third issue and a $2 third and second. So uh, beautiful color on this one. Let's see on a high catalog stamps and beautiful color. This one I threw in because it's just a very unique usage. I don't know if this guy was a stamp collector or what. Because uh, tax is $2 and he could have probably just stuck two $1 stamps on it or a dollar stamp or four fifties. But he just used a little bit of everything. A dollar, a 50, a 25, two tens and a five. So I'm calling that a philatelic use. Ooh. There were stamp collectors at this time, so maybe you got a little creative. Here's a lease for 224 Lexington Avenue in New York City for $2,000 per year. The tax was 50 cents up to 300 of rent and 50 cents additional for each 200. So when you get up to $2,000, that nicely made a $5 stamp pay the tax. Personal property, um, we have a contract for a broker, a stock broker, or other kind of a broker, business broker, bill of sale, ship, wares return, and a warehouse receipt. Contract brokers relates to sales by persons acting as a broker. Bill of sale, ship, in the original law, the way they wrote it, they, they could tax real estate, but they didn't write it where they could tax ships. And shipping was a big business back then, so they got smart and added that one in too. So here's a broker's note. It's a, a agreement, and this is for six bales of goat skins coming from Calcutta. There's a 10 cent tax on that coming through Boston. Um, this is a contract for sale of securities. This is what you see a lot of times. It, you see this a lot more in the in the 1914 and the, or 1917 when they had the taxes for World War One, because you know stock markets are so much bigger then. So you'll see tons and tons from that era this era they're uh, not quite as common this is a nice one the office of hatch foot and company 273 dollars so it was taxed one cent per hundred that's a three cent tax here's a bale of sale of a ship with a nice twenty dollar imperf on it um twenty thousand dollar sale so the tax is 50 cents per 500 so it's twenty dollars for the steamboat metamora you see they have a nice uh ship yet on the on the document the weigher's return is a very rare tax they, it was in effect for a shorter period and because it was rescinded in 1866 and the tax information back then you can imagine they didn't you know, go on the tv and get your uh, email and tell you that all these tax rules have changed and laws have changed it had to be disseminated through newspapers and other other means and it took a while to get there. So the tax, this document is October 17th, even though the tax was rescinded on August 1st. But, you know, they didn't know it was rescinded. This is some guy here doing his job out in the, I forget where it's from. I don't even know if I know where it's from. But uh, it's, you know, on a written piece of paper. It's not like a big business form or anything. So it's quite possible this gentleman had no idea that the tax had been rescinded yet. This is another early matching use. You can see this is a warehouse receipt stamp. And the warehouse receipts are kind of hard to come by on documents. A lot of times they were just destroyed because there was no reason to save them once the, once the term was over. So uh, this is for 100, looks like boxes of sugar. Storeroom number three from February 63. I moved into a transportation. This is where I had to get a little more creative. It's a bill of lading to send stuff on a ship, entry of goods when goods pass over a border into, express when you're sending something by an express company receipt, receipt for delivery of property by express company, um, a manifest, charter party, and I put telegraph in here. Because lastly, there was a tax on telegraph dispatches for the transmission of a message. So they're transporting the message. That's where I got. I had to get a little creative for that one, but it worked, I think. So here's a bill of lading to convey one carriage tongue from New York to Liverpool, tax of 10 cents. 
Here's an entry of goods, and you can see this is the entry of immigrants effects. It tells you who it's imported by, and it came on the ferry, Satmia, and it doesn't say what it really is. It's like 10 boxes of goods or something. But the tax was 50 cents because it was valued at $100. Uh, Express Company, I mentioned earlier, they were very successful in getting the tax rescinded on the documents and just paying a flat tax on business. But here's a nice early January 63 American Express Company receipt and tax at one cent um, because it was not over 25 cents was the charge to ship whatever they were shipping. Here's another one for de delivery for re or receipt for delivery of property. When the tax came back into effect in 1864, um, they had to start paying a tax again on the actual paper. This is the Adams Express Company. These are all, everybody got together into American Express pretty much over the years, but this is when Adams was still very successful. And they lobbied in, in uh, that tax only lasted eight months before it was rescinded in 65. Here's a receipt for delivery of property. And this is a nice one. This is on the Union line. It's a nice colorful little document with a red star. But the little two cent bank check is on green paper. At the time they were printing proprietary stamps on green paper and the revenue documentaries were not supposed to be printed on green. And this one got printed on the wrong paper. So that's a very rare stamp on it. It's a, you know, an expensive and rare stamp on its own, let alone on a document. A nice little colorful one at that. Charter party. This is a charter for a ship, Tri Mountain, from New York to Liverpool. Um, the tax was short paid. This tax was five dollars for up to six hundred tons. The shift was lifted at thirteen hundred and one tons. The tax should have been ten dollars. But once again, um, charter parties are few and far between. There's probably only about twenty known examples out there. Nice little X flag they've got there in the E.E. E. Morgan's Sons line. Telegraphs, um, they were based on the charge. And you can see this one was 10D35, meaning showing 10 words, amount paid 35 cents, thereby justifying the three cent tax. Um, this is for uh, up in Delavan, Wisconsin. Was, but there were two of these found. And uh, there's only like I think two or maybe three known from this find. Telegraph dispatches were also almost uniformly just destroyed after a certain amount of time. There was only one big find of these called the Millbury find, Millbury, Connecticut. That's about the only ones you find other than just onesie twosies from other places. Um, other contracts, I put life insurance, insurance and agreement appraisals together. Life insurance is obvious a life insurance policy. Once again, not too many people had life insurance policies back then. It was mostly the more well to do. Um, insurance were mostly used for businesses, for real property, usually against fire, sometimes some other things. An agreement was kind of a, a catch-all that they used to make sure we get at least some kind of tax on every little, any kind of paper transaction that occurred. So they charged five cents for an agreement. Here's a life insurance policy from the Excelsior Life Insurance Company in New York. Um, premium was 35.67. So they were very expensive. It was taxed at 25 cents for policy up to a thousand. So the life insurance was based on the amount of insurance up to a thousand dollars you paid a quarter. Here's an insurance on property. And this is an interesting one beginning, beginning 1863 insuring value of a store inventory. The value varied each year, in 63 and 65, we had premiums of 25 cents. 10 cents and then 25 cents. So as they had more inventory to insure, they had to get a bigger policy and the, and the price went up. You can see the first one has a, a handwritten signature. The second one has handwritten and the third one has a real nice uh, Western Insurance Company, Pittsburgh hand stamp on that stamp. Here's another insurance policy, um, only taxed at 10 cents. It was mail, so they folded up the insurance policy wrote the guy's name on it and mailed it just as they would like an old folded letter. That was an efficient way of mailing them out. They didn't have to use any post or any envelopes. Here's an agreement to sell a farming equipment. This one's interesting to me because it's Mrs. Mary Manny in Rockford, Illinois. This is a very large uh, implement dealer here in Rockford that uh, 
a John H. Manny's patented adjustable and combined reaping and mowing machines. I have a, a variety of documents related to this company, from a big, a big find that was came out in the market years and years ago. Uh, we have legal and court activity. Here we have a general certificate. Those are just certificates where the judge or a notary or a official had to certify something and it wasn't something that they wanted to tax specifically. So there was just a smaller amount taxed there. A certificate by a marine surveyor. They had a general bond, a surety bond, probate of will for your will, original process, which is a legal document, which in most cases was a summons, and a power of attorney to let a power, an attorney do something for you. The general certificate taxed a broad class of documents. Certificate by a marine surveyor was a special category that they had just to tax a little higher. Um, wills and letters of administration are listed under probity will. And a power of attorney general covers any power specifically listed, not specifically listed as a power of attorney. So here's a, a general certificate, 1865, proof of publication, taxed at five cents. This detailed certificate provides information that they put this ad in the paper for four weeks. It was for property to sell the property for delinquent taxes. But they had to show the document and then they, they had a form to fill out to show that it was advertised for four weeks before they could you know, take action against the person. This is an interesting document. Um, it's another certificate, five cents, District of Columbia, Orphans Court. And it's a certified copy of a guardianship. So someone needed a copy of some document. So they made a certified copy. And then the, the DC District of Columbia made up these little gray stamps, US revenue stamp, five cents, just to indicate that there was a five cent stamp on the original document. So it's very unusual. I've only seen a couple of these. Uh, nobody else really made up a, a pen stamp to show it. We do have another document where they actually drew the shape of a 50 cent stamp and put 50 cents in all four corners to make it look like a stamp to show that there was a stamp there. But this is the only place that's ever found where they made up a little label or sticker to, to indicate that there was a tax paid. Here's a certificate. This is a marriage certificate. They're quite common back then. This is one of the more ornate ones with lots of information on it. And uh, the uh, rate was changed in March 3rd, 1863 from 10 cents down to five cents, but it was took effect immediately. So obviously that information did not get disseminated for quite a while. So this one was taxed at 10 cents. But look at that, it's not a uh, revenue stamp, it's a postage stamp usual 10 center from 1863s. So this is once again, a very nice example. Um, businesses you wouldn't think would screw up and use postage stamps too often. But these are basically just, you know, ministers and clergymen all around the country. This is from Janesville, Wisconsin. That, you know, they just got the stamps and used them. They probably didn't know a whole lot of difference between the stamps. So it's not uncommon to have these kind of things that were used by the general public and properly taxed with postage stamps. Here's a general bond taxed to 25 cents. And this is to sell strong and spirituous liquors and wines. So it's basically just a, a liquor license in essence. So uh, they had to put a bond up and put so much money up for the, they have the license. Here's a fun one. This is a bond for a justice of the peace. And in the blow up that I've shown here, it's kind of funny because it talks about what all he's done. He will faithfully, diligently, and impartially do and perform all and every act required by me by law as such justice of the peace during my continuance in office according to the best of my ability. And I do swear that I have not a fought a duel, nor set or accepted a challenge to fight a duel, the probable issue of which might have been the death of either party, nor been a second to either party, nor in any manner aided or assisted in such duel nor been knowingly the bearer of such challenge or acceptance since the adoption of the Constitution. And that I will not so engage, be concerned, or directly or indirectly during my continuous of office. So help me God. So half of his oath face like it was talking about duels. So let's have a big problem with judges and duels back then. So I want to make sure that the judges weren't uh, in any way participating in duels. They were trying to finally stop it from happening. Here's a letters of guardianship from Illinois and uh, Clay County here. 
And this one's interesting because the stamp, they didn't have any dollar stamps. It was a dollar tax back then, between 2,500 and 5,000. So they cut a $2 stamp in half, crossed out the one, the $2, two on it, and used it as a $1 stamp. I have the other document, which is a guardian's bond. This is the letters of guardianship and a bond. They kind of went together usually. And that has the other half of the stamp on it. You can see I put them both together there. So yeah, both halves of the same stamp on two different documents executed the same day. So that's a really nice that those were able to stay together for all these years. Here's what I talked about a summons. This is basically to the sheriff of wherever it's going, hereby summon so-and-so to appear in court. There's a 50 cent tax on that. That's a fairly good amount. Um, the last thing we have is corporate activities. There was a certificate of profits, a power of attorney voting. If you wanted to give your, you know, when you give the company the power to vote your stock for you, your shares for you, um, a certificate of stock, and then a power of attorney for stock, for someone to sell your stock. So these are all corporate activities. Um, certificates of profit can be very uh, ornate, very large. You can see this is one with a nice second issue 10 cent stamp on it. And I think a lot of these, same thing when we get some of the stock certificates, the, the engraving, the vignettes, it just, it looked official. It gave you a lot more confidence that this company was a good company. They were, uh, they made some money here. So this is a nice Atlantic Mutual Insurance Company certificate of profits. Here's a power of attorney to, to vote shares from March 63, March 2nd. So this is one of those early matching uses again. It's got a power of attorney heart perf. You can see there's only perforations on the sides, not the top and bottom. Um, that's a very nice example of that. There's a stock certificate. I got a few nice stock certificates to show here. Here's the December Oil Company. Very beautiful vignette. Um, all the little oil fields out there and got those, looks like they got big vats for all the oil they're pulling up and everything else. So made you feel comfortable that this is a good outstanding company. On the left, we've got capital stock of a million dollars, which was a lot of money in 1865. There's 1,000 shares of the stock. So. Here's another one. Railroad companies are very popular. Burlington and Missouri River Railroad Company in Nebraska. You don't see many documents from the mid, you know, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, those kind of areas. Because there just wasn't a lot out there back then. I mean, the population boom hadn't gotten there. The Indians were still running around. So this is a beautiful train vignette. You can see that really cool old train pulling the cars and uh, the second issue stamp on that one. Um, insurance power uh, stock surveys were another area where this, the stamp paper was useful because they were all taxed at 25 cents. So when stamp paper really got more popular in 1865, a lot of companies would print up their shares and, and have them with the stamp on it. This is a nice Boston and Worcester Railroad Company. And it was a nice 25 cent RN on it. Here's a stock story for the Quincy Mining Company of Michigan. Quincy Mining Company in Michigan was based in New York. And there was a massive hoard, semi loads of paper that was pulled out of this company. A lot of documents that were found back in, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, people just went in there and ransacked it and cut all the stamps off and threw everything else away. This hold, or this finding or hoard, all the documents came out. So there's many, many early matching uses, early, early documents, and a lot of high, high value documents with high dollar stamps on them that came out through that. And this one's interesting because it was a stock certificate, so it was taxed at 25 cents. And then it was assigned. So the stock was sold and they had to pay another 25 or 25 cents to sell the stock. So it's got two matching certificate stamps on it. So it's kind of a, a double match. Here's a power of attorney to sell. This is kind of a standard form they had at the time. And basically you're authorizing as an attorney to sell your stock for you. Um, another railroad company. Um, at the time, you know, we talked about that guy had the receipt for the business college he was going to. And they also, business colleges also taught their, their students how to fill out all these documents and how to use the tax stamps appropriately. So this is a college up in Maine and they issued their own stamps because they were supposed to write on the stamp to cancel the stamp. So they would fill out the entire doc, excuse me, letter of administration document 
And then they would actually put the stamp on it and cancel the stamp. That was part of their class, part of their education. And that's all I got. I appreciate the time. Any questions? Tim, it's Melanie. Where? What are some good places to find material like this? Um, you find it on eBay rarely. There's there's stuff on eBay is is mostly just kind of checks and nothing too exciting. Um, usually, you have to go to the stamp shows. There's two big revenue dealers in the U.S. Eric Jackson and Richard Friedberg. And they're the two that uh, usually come up with this stuff pretty regularly. There's uh, occasionally uh, you'll find stuff on eBay or some other places. And then whenever I go to a smaller stamp show when there's a, a bunch of dealers that, you know, whatever they might, I always ask, do you have any old revenue documents or old checks? Or sometimes you find some great stuff and pay a pretty decent price for it too because they don't know what they have. That didn't happen too much anymore. So. And then the best way to find out this is you need to know the guy in California that has more than everything else put the, uh... together. <laughs> and get him to sell you something. That's hard, though. <laughs> right, Ken? Try to get Mike to sell you something. <laughs> I have a question. Beautiful material. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested in uh, I, when I see the hand cancels, I'm always kind of. Uh, kind of gloss over it because I can't read that stuff very well. Mm -hmm. But does anybody specialize very much in who did the canceling as opposed to what was it all about? Oh yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people that collect the stamps with those fancy or those cancels on them too. So the ones where you get a full strike are, are, are quite sought after. And there's there's books that have been written in all the railroad cancels. The American Revenue Association has a the, the American Revenue or their quarterly journal has been running series of on ship cancels, both printed like that, and then printed in straight line, and then also just hand name where they, you know, SS whatever, you know, and canceled for the ship. So there's a lot of people that collect those kind of things, but railroads, insurance companies are big, big. Are they getting down to the point of like, which person did the hand cancel? No, nah, I don't think they get down to the person so much. Sometimes on the document, the, the person that signed the document can be, uh, a famous person occasionally uh -huh. but who actually did the canceling it usually was a clerk you know these businesses and stuff they say usually had clerks doing all this tim you mentioned the uh rockford farm implement company mm -hmm. um just as a refresher because i know some of us know how, how far back does your family go in in, in rockford yeah my family moved to illinois in 1842 in Boone County, yeah. From where? From Vermont area, Rhode Island, that area. Yeah. 